All right. Uh, welcome, everybody, to Glognet. Uh, this month, we are pleased to welcome Sean Walker, who will be talking to us about .NET MAUI and Blazor hybrid apps. A little bit about Glognet. Uh, we are the Greater Lansing user group for .NET developers based out of Okemos, Michigan, pictured here. Our meetings are held every month on the third Thursday, free and open to the public to attend. For more information on upcoming meetings, the best place to go would be meetup.com slash glugnet. I would, at this point, we'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsors, NIS Technologies, who is giving us this go-to session for the meeting this evening, the .NET Foundation, whose support helps us pay the bills for the group, and TechSmith, our normal physical hosting site. Uh, we are in talks with them, trying to get back in person as soon as we can. So hopefully we'll have some more news on that coming up soon. Uh, recordings of all of our meetups are recorded and posted to YouTube by our own Sam Nasser. You can find him at youtube.com slash at Sam Nasser MVP or use this QR code on the screen. During this evening's presentation, we ask that you please remain muted unless you are answering or asking a question of our speaker. Uh, if you are uncomfortable speaking up, but you still want to participate, there is a chat feature as well, which I will monitor and feed those responses and such back to you, Sean, as we get them. Additionally, at the end of tonight's presentation, we will have an anonymous survey that for all attendees, uh, your honest feedback is very much appreciated. It gets rolled up into a summary and sent to Sean so he can improve this presentation for other groups going forward. Uh, we are looking for lightning talks for future meetups. So if you have a topic that you are passionate about and you're willing to give us 10 to 15 minutes of it, we would love to hear from you. Uh, you can contact either Joe Kunk or myself and we'll get you slotted into a meetup. Uh, next month, Glugnet is celebrating its 20th anniversary and as a special treat, uh, we were able to book Carl Franklin of .NET Rocks fame and other podcasts. So the, uh, that'll be on April 20th. Uh, make sure to mark that one on your calendar. That should be a really good meetup. Uh, some additional meetups uh, that you might be interested in. Our friends over at the Cleveland c -Sharp VB Net user group who currently don't have anything scheduled yet on Meetup, but I'm sure they'll have something soon. Uh, the Greater Lansing Area for SQL Server, otherwise known as GLASS. A .NET study group. And MI.NET. Uh, they, one note there, they are in-person only right now out of Southfield, Michigan. So that may or may not be an option for you, but if you're in the area, that's one you might want to check out. And now it's time for a featured presentation. Right. Do you have to do something to enable me to share? I do. Give me one moment here. All right. Okay, you should be good now, Sean. All right. Hey, look at that. Works. All right, I assume everyone can see my initial slide? Yes. All right. Okay, so yeah, I am excited to talk to you today about Blazor Hybrid. Um, obviously, it's a, a newer technology that uh, Microsoft released um, that sort of is another evolutionary step um, as part of the Blazor journey. And it offers some new capabilities that I think developers should at least be aware of um, because it solves some additional 
scenarios that um, maybe weren't possible in the past. Um, obviously, this is my first presentation that I've done at the Greater Lansing User Group, um, and I appreciate um, the reach out from Joe to ask me to speak. Um, this particular presentation I did once before. Um, it was actually at .NET Conf uh, in November of last year as part of um, .NET 7 release. And, uh, but I actually didn't do the presentation even sort of virtually in person. It was a canned presentation. Um, John Galloway had reached out to me and asked if I would just record a 30 minute session that they would include in the content for .NET Conf. So that was a bit of a, I, I hadn't been asked to do that before. So with no audience whatsoever, it was a bit of a, a different task for me, but um, hopefully it will turn out even better this time. Um, so I'm Sean Walker. I guess my claim to fame is that I am the original creator of an open source project called .NET Nuke, um, which is often abbreviated as DNN. Um, that was way back in late 2002, 2003, so a long time ago, <laughs> almost 20 years ago now. Um, that project, uh, because it was, I guess, uh, an open source project that was in the very early stages of .NET, like .NET version 1, um, got a lot of attention. Uh, it actually got a lot of traction because it, it had capabilities that people were looking for at the time um, in a variety of different ways. It, it provided sort of a, a path forward or an example project that people could look at when they were migrating their skills from maybe classic ASP or VB.net to this new sort of web forms model. Um, and then it also had capabilities in it where you could manage content um, interactively online through a browser. So a content management system is what some people like to call that. Um, and so it had some capabilities in it, which perhaps I guess didn't really exist elsewhere. Um, later, of course, SharePoint took on some of those capabilities as well um, and became maybe one of the bigger alternatives that was available. Um, and of course, with Microsoft behind it was a, you know, became a, you know, a beast of its own. Um, I am a Microsoft MVP. Um, I guess I've been a Microsoft MVP for 14 years, but not continuously. I was an MVP for quite a long period of time. And then I had a, a like a break from it where I wasn't participating as much in the community channels. And so I wasn't an MVP for about five years. Uh, last year, I was awarded the MVP again. So I was very proud of that, <laughs> especially the first time round, I felt like it was actually easier for me to get the MVP status because I had, you know, sort of ridden the wave of .NET Nuke. Um, second time round, you know, it just it took a lot of um, community involvement to get recognized as an MVP. I'm also part of a group called the ASP Insiders, which probably a lot of folks haven't even heard of because they're not really that active lately. Um, and more recently, I'm the creator of an open source project called Octane, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that today. Um, in essence, I guess you, some people could consider Octane to be the successor to .NET Nuke because it's, it's essentially an application framework that implements a lot of the same features that .NET Nuke had, but in modern technology. So built from the ground up using all modern uh, architecture and, and tooling. Um, I'm also the chair of the .NET Foundation Project Committee. Um, I've been a volunteer with the .NET Foundation since 2014 when it was first created, worked with all of the executive directors that were part of it during that time, worked with all the boards that were elected as part of it. Um, and my committee is responsible for evaluating new project applications that are submitted. Um, so typically it would be, you know, .NET based open source projects that would like to become part of the .NET Foundation. Um, we review those projects just to determine if they have a viable community around them, right? How long they've been around, if they're mature um, in terms of the, you know, the functionality that they offer. Um, and then if we if we determine that, we make recommendations to the board. Um, where, and the, it's actually up to the board to vote on whether or not projects join the foundation or not. We're also board. Uh, um, we're also part of the offboarding um, group as well. So when a project wants to leave the foundation for whatever reason, um, we're part of the group that um, takes that helps with that process as well, which is that process that was defined um, last year. Um, I'm a Canadian. 
uh, but I currently live in Florida uh, near West Palm Beach. Um, and yeah, that's enough about me. Oh, and I guess in my professional life, I am uh, CTO of professional services for Cognizant, um, where I focus on uh, professional services firms, meaning like the, the big four accounting firms like Deloitte, KPMG, PwC, and EY, as well as the mid-market firms in that space, as well as some other um, companies in our portfolio, such as Equifax and others. So a lot of large enterprise companies um, where we're involved in, I guess, doing very large digital transformation projects. So if we focus for a moment, I guess, on the content of this presentation, which is uh, Blazor Hybrid, I guess the first thing I want to do is set a little bit of context. And so obviously this presentation is going to be about multi-platform application development. And so, you know, with all of the devices and operating systems that are in existence today, um, it's become a real challenge for developers to embrace um, all of these, you know, the changing landscape that's out there and build applications which can cater to all of them. Obviously, there's the option to build individual applications that are specialized to each platform or device, but that can be very, very costly, right? Both in terms of the initial development as well as just maintaining them in the long term. So what businesses have been hoping for is technologies which could maybe pull these together so you could write fewer applications and still target all of those different platforms and devices um, to create effective applications. So the the, uh, the questions that of course come up when you're considering you know ap application development is you got so many options today of what you could choose right you could build a web application um, you could build a native op application um, and that native application meaning both it could be mobile or desktop or you could build a hybrid application so you've got a lot of different options and a lot of different tools and technologies that are available to, to build things in, in these various ways. Um, if we take a step back and just think of a, of a pure native application for a moment, and again, thinking of both mobile and desktop, you would build your application and typically you would do that by leveraging some native capabilities of a platform. And usually that platform would have some native widgets or components, which would be how you would build the user interface um, you would also have some kind of a capability to deal with events that are part of that user interface. And of course, those components need to actually render their output to some type of a canvas, right, depending on what the platform is. Um, on the other side, you also have services that you need to interact with, like services that would provide interoperability with things like cameras or even a mouse or Bluetooth devices or you know various things that could provide input to your application um, to handle some of its more specialized needs. There's been a number of different technologies over time um, that have been created to make it possible to build applications using one code base so that they can run on multiple platforms. Right, so some examples that I have here are Xamarin, of course, more recently, Uno Platform, React Native. These are all platforms that have been built to provide this bridge capability, right? So you can write your code, and then your code leverages this abstraction layer, which I've also called a bridge, so that it can target multiple platforms with all of the capabilities that you would get if you built the application natively. And so, and these are all very robust and um, capable solutions that exist in the market today. Um, however, you know, nothing is ever perfect. And so there's always, you know, some limitations. And, and some of these products are still, you know, on various stages of their journey, uncovering many different use cases. So perhaps they will eventually cover all the use cases. But as it stands today, you know, there still is always going to be gaps that they cannot deliver on. Um, another application framework that um, has been popular in recent years is called Flutter, and Flutter also tries to deliver on that same app, that same problem space essentially of building a code base which can target multiple platforms. I guess the difference in the case of Flutter um, is that it has its own native widgets and rendering engine, 
um, which is part of that abstraction layer. So instead of relying on the, the you know the widgets and stuff that are part of the platform itself, um, it leverages a library called Skia, which actually can write directly to the the canvas of the device and raise events and interact with events. And some people would argue that this this approach provides a more performant um, end result when you build applications using Flutter than some of the, the previous um, products that I just mentioned in the previous slide. And of course, you still have the same capability to target all of the, uh, you know, the different capabilities of the device, such as location services, Bluetooth sensors and camera um, through platform channels. So again, very capable option, um, not necessarily, you know, aligned with Microsoft technology for those of us who have long been in the Microsoft space, right? Building a Flutter app is kind of, you know, stepping out into a non-Microsoft development space, um, but, but very capable. Um, so for those of us familiar with the .NET platform, of course, there is a ton of functionality that's been developed over time and made available to developers. Um, I guess the problem <laughs> with all of this variety is that there's not necessarily technologies which unify them and bring them all together. Um, and when we're talking about application development models that can cater to multiple platforms or multiple devices, you really are focused on web, desktop, and mobile, right? And so for web, you've got ASP.NET, you've got Blazor, um, desktop, you've got WPF, you've got WinForms, and mobile, you got Xamarin. These are all distinct technology platforms that you can use to build applications, applications that are fit for purpose for those specific areas that they were created for. Um, but there's not necessarily a story here which brings them all together and would allow you to build essentially an application using one code base that could target all of those platforms and devices. So Microsoft started talking about a project or a product, I guess, a few years ago, um, which was created specifically to address this problem space, right? So that you could build applications that would target multiple devices and platforms. They codenamed it Maui. Um, and Maui, of course, doesn't refer to the island of Maui, which is a very beautiful place. I've been lucky enough to go to a couple of times. Um, but it, in fact, refers to, it's an acronym, which stands for Multi-Platform Application UI. So um, MAUI is intended to be the technology platform which provides sort of this unifying capability so you could build applications and target multiple platforms. Um, and in essence, it became essentially the evolution of Xamarin. And for those of us who were familiar with Xamarin or built Xamarin applications in the past, that was also a very capable technology still widely used today. Um, it was an acquisition. Uh, by Microsoft, um, because it was, of course, uh, an independent company for a long time, and Microsoft acquired it, uh, geez, quite a number of years ago now, probably more than five years ago. Um, and they, you know, embraced it, brought it into the uh, the ASP.NET um, space as the preferred development tools for building mobile applications. And, of course, they've continued to evolve it over time. Um, and, of course, the latest sort of evolution of Xamarin is .NET MAUI. And it was released last May, so May, almost a year ago, I guess, in May 24th, 2022, right, for general availability, um, fully supported for production workloads. Um, so that was a big release. And I think it's also significant that they released it at that time because they released it on .NET 6. And for those of us who keep track of Microsoft release numbers, we know that .NET 6 was a long-term service release for Microsoft. And enterprise clients like long-term support releases. And so it meant that enterprises could dive into MAUI immediately last May and start building applications. Because if, they, if Microsoft had waited until .NET 7, which is a GA release, to release .NET MAUI, then there probably would have been a lot less people who would be interested in building applications for it, right? Because typically it's the even numbered releases which will get greater attention, right? .NET 6 and then of course .NET 8 will be coming out this November. Um, so anyways, Microsoft released 
the initial Maui release along with .NET 6. So .NET Maui is a cross-platform framework for creating native, mobile, and desktop applications with C Sharp and XAML. So, and I think the, keep, the thing to keep in mind is that, you know, .NET Maui is a very sort of full-featured set of tools that is designed to solve this particular problem, right, of building applications for mobile and desktop. Um, but the question that comes up when you sort of look at this model is it's great that it that handles mobile devices and it handles desktop devices, but a lot of enterprise clients are also building web applications. So how come, you know, what, what can we do if we actually want to build a code base that can handle web as well? Um, native Maui is, you know, not really, I guess, being positioned as the answer to that. Um, so, like I said, what about web? Like, what are we supposed to do if we want to build an application that targets all platforms, um, including web, you know? And so how would we do that, right? What would the specific technology choices be that we would make to target web, mobile, and desktop? So luckily, um, Microsoft had sort of already been thinking about this problem for a while. Um, and they had developed this capability called Blazor, right, which was initially focused on web alone um, and had a couple different flavors, right, where you could target you, different hosting models, right, where you could run it on the server or you could run it client side on WebAssembly. Um, but it was always the goal that there would be additional ways that you could leverage Blazor in other ways, right, because Blazor itself is based on a fairly generic um, hosting or sorry component model and that component model is very adaptable to a lot of different scenarios so essentially blazer to the rescue uh, Microsoft shared this diagram pretty early on in the evolution of blazer to sort of give you some foresight into understanding like where they were going with this technology so blazer server obviously was the first version that they came out with with full support um, they were already working on Blazor WebAssembly, so it was already in preview stages from a very early point with Blazor. And so you could play with it. Of course, then it became production ready. Um, you could build progressive web applications as well using Blazor. Uh, but they always hinted that you would be also able to build hybrid applications or even native applications using this same component model that Blazor has. Um, and there were some, you know, early projects that were done as experimental projects, which Microsoft shared with the community and, you know, to basically say that this is directionally, you know, what we we're thinking of, this is where we're going, hop on board for the ride. And we're, you know, it's going someplace, which is interesting. So with Blazor, they added a new capability for Blazor Hybrid. And specifically, of course, Blazor Hybrid is intended to satisfy this use case around desktop and mobile development. So now we have like a, a server, Blazor server hosting model, we have Blazor WebAssembly, and now we have Blazor Hybrid as another option that we can use. And of course, if you, if you take advantage of the Blazor model, you can build an application that will work and operate on all of these different you know, um, devices and platforms. Um, I'm hoping at this point, everyone that is um, watching this presentation has had the opportunity to at least, you know, play with Blazor. Um, I got involved with Blazor, geez, when it was still in its preview stages, I think like it wasn't even a, it was still in an experimental product within Microsoft. Um, it was in the early preview releases and um, it was actually Scott Hunter which reached out to me and said, hey, you know, have you looked at this Blazor um, product that we're building? It's still experimental, but it has a really interesting component model. You might want to take a look at it. Obviously, he reached out to me because of my background with .NET Nuke. And .NET Nuke, um, one of the reasons why it was very popular is it because it, it leveraged the web forms component model to build a application framework, which was very dynamic. And so I think he was probably hinting that, you know, this, this new technology Blazor would also be able to accomplish similar things, but with obviously newer tech, he was right. Um, and so that's when I got involved with Blazor and I've been working on it ever since. Um, obviously, you know, it, it has matured quite a lot in the last four or five years. Um, 
not just because of the newer hosting models that um, have been enabled on it, but because of the capabilities of the framework itself have, you know, continued to evolve to meet the needs of enterprise developers. And so um, fundamentally, it's based around this component model where you, you know, a component is essentially a chunk of UI um, that's built in HTML, JavaScript, CSS, essentially. Um, it has all of the standard things you would expect in a component model, such as routing, the ability to pass parameters, events. It's got two-way binding, and it's got some lifecycle events. So um, if you have built applications using JavaScript frameworks, such as React or Vue, um, you're obviously very familiar with a component-based development approach. And so the Blazor technology allows you to use that type of an approach using native C Sharp, as opposed to using JavaScript uh, for building your, your client applications. Um, obviously, from a high level, the way that's, that the hosting models work is for Blazor server, the actual Blazor components are executed on the server, and there's a SignalR connection that's established with the browser, essentially a web socket, and all of the rendering events, um, et cetera, are channeled through that very fast SignalR connection. Um, and it obviously does differential updates to the object model within the browser. Um, if you don't want to rely on SignalR or you maybe have limitations in your environment, um, you also have the ability to use Blazor WebAssembly. And I could do a whole other presentation on WebAssembly. In fact, I have. Um, it's a, a, obviously a very interesting technology in terms of the fact that it's a new client-side technology that allows you to build very native applications that run in the browser um, and don't have to use JavaScript. Um, and Blazor allows you to build applications in C Sharp, in .NET, which can then run in the browser using the WebAssembly runtime. Um, and in this model, of course, it means that your web components, like your Razor components, are running natively in the browser, and the, the uh, interactions with the, the object model of the browser are happening on the device itself, right? So there's no transfer that's happening across the wire between the server and the uh, client. It's all happening in real time on the client natively. So really powerful technology there as well. Um, Microsoft also had something that they released a couple of years ago called, Ex and they, they tagged it as experimental, but it was mobile Blazor bindings. And so essentially this was like, a hint in the direction that they were going to go with Blazor, right? By combining the, the capabilities of Razor components with the Xamarin model to allow you to build native and hybrid applications um, using Blazor. They would also leverage Xamarin, but it would allow you to essentially run on mobile and desktop, right? So this was, again, a hint at the direction that they were going to go. Um, I believe Elon Lipton was largely behind this um, experimental project. He's been with Microsoft for a long time, super smart guy. Um, and, you know, a lot of those ideas ended up materializing as part of um, Blazor Hybrid. So how does Blazor Hybrid work? Well, it leverages a web view component. Um, and that's essentially why it's called hybrid, because this, you know, using a web view component in a desktop or a mobile application isn't a new concept, right? There's been other technologies and JavaScript frameworks in particular that took this approach in the past. Um, so, I mean, it's, it, it is a proven approach um, and it was a way that Microsoft could, you know, provide the capabilities of Blazor um, on both mobile and desktop. So for those of you who have built um, hybrid mobile applications using, you know, some of the technologies which are quite commonplace and popular, um, you know, for the last, I would say, geez, like at least five or more years, things like Cordova and Ionic, um, they also used a web view um, component, right? And the web view would allow these JavaScript frameworks to, you know, interact with your backend code, 
and they would provide the updates to the user interface in the platform itself to provide sort of you know one code base that you could write um, and then you could target multiple platforms and devices with it and they also had a bridge capability much like the earlier um, platforms that we talked about to directly leverage the capabilities of these devices so again you sort of have the full picture the ability to build a single application that can target uh, at least in this case it was well and in some of these cases this this could even tackle the dilemma of web mobile and desktop right so these these technologies actually could could handle all three and then along comes blazer hybrid um it is slightly of course different in its implementation than than cordova or ionic um, because it's of course the the ui is written in c sharp as razor components and there is a blazer web view component which of course is then embedded within a standard web view but the blazer web view component is interesting in the sense that it interprets your c sharp razor components and they actually will run natively on the device as opposed to you know being executed somewhere else perhaps on the server or elsewhere right so they it allows you to get near native performance from your razor components when you're running in a desktop environment or a mobile environment so this is very powerful right um, and again, of course, it provides that bridge capability so that you can leverage the capabilities of these devices as well. Um, specifically around desktop, um, and if you want to target, you know, or use Blazor Hybrid in various environments, like for example, if you want to use it in a WinForms environment or a WPF environment, you can do that because there is a WebView 2 component that Microsoft released as part of um, Blazor Hybrid that can be embedded in these types of rich client applications, like using the traditional technology that you've always used for building WinForms or WPF. It's essentially just another component that's part of your toolbox. You can drag it into your application service, and then you can write Blazor components or Razor components, which are executed within that web view um, to create you know, rich applications. So that's how you can obviously leverage desktop. And what about cross-platform? Because in, there, in this case, we're talking WinForms and WPF. These were, of course, technologies which would only cater to Microsoft operating system environments. What if you want to target a non-Microsoft operating system environment like, like Mac or Linux? Um, obviously, Electron has been the most popular choice of technology for building those types of applications for, for quite some time. Um, there's lots of applications that we use today which actually leverage Electron under the covers. Uh, the, probably the best example is VS Code, right? It's an Electron-based application. Um, and so Microsoft has done some experiments in this area. In fact, Steve Sanderson, who is, I guess, what you would call, you know, the, the founder, the creator originally of Blazor, created a concept called Web Window at one point, which was, you know, the, uh, provided the ability to run um, Blazor Hybrid in Electron as a, cross-platform environment. Um, this was the support for this approach was not offered as part of the early releases of Blazor Hybrid, but I suspect that in the future, something like this will materialize. Um, obviously, one of the, the big benefits that we talked about, like from the very beginning of this presentation, is code reusability, right? You want to be able to build an application using one code base that'll run on as many platforms and devices as possible right and um, so with blazor hybrid you can build a razor class library using razor components and those components can run in a web context using either hosting model right server or web assembly or they can run in a desktop or mobile context um, using the you know the maui client and the the web view concept right um, and so with this capability it really does allow you to have a single code base that targets targets everything um, of course there's you know always going to be critics <laughs> about 
you know, various approaches, right? The, the various people will have different opinions and, and a lot of these opinions are 100% valid. So um, what are the trade-offs? So there's always been talk about native versus hybrid. So on the native side, people would say that if you wanna build something that has the absolute best performance and probably has a pixel for pixel, you know, perfect rendering of what you would expect on a particular device, native, it's still the best approach for doing that. Um, it also probably provides the most robust hardware integration, right, with the different capabilities that are part of various devices. However, the downside for native, of course, is you have to build a bespoke, distinct application to target each environment, each device, which is very costly and complicated. On the hybrid side, you're going to give up some of that performance perhaps and some of that native ux look and feel in exchange for faster development time less expensive development and of course reusable code so that's really the trade-offs that you have to make and it's of course not always clear which direction to go so you really have to listen to the requirements that are shared with you by your clients of course um, and hopefully they are thinking ahead <laughs> um, and not just giving you the requirements for today, because if they only do that, then you might cho choose a certain path. And then tomorrow they tell you that, well, in fact, we actually, you know, want to have a single code base to target multiple platforms. And, you know, then you're going to have to redo a lot of work. So it's important to ask those questions up front. Um, as far as a demo, um, I mentioned earlier that... Uh, an open source project um, for a number of years now that is sort of like the successor, I guess, to .NET Nuke. Um, the project's called Octane. Um, it's again, it's an open source modular application framework with a similar, similar capabilities, I guess, as what .NET Nuke had. Um, it's more than 260,000 lines of code at this point. It's got a, more than 100 Razor components. It's got more than 30 API services that are part of it. Um, it has a lot of more advanced use cases that are implemented in it. For example, it's got its own custom router, doesn't use the standard Blazor router. Um, it has support for plugin modules and themes. It supports four different database engines. So, um, so yeah, because it's cross-platform, right, and built on .NET Core, of course, if it only supported SQL Server, that would not be that useful. So it supports uh, MySQL, Postgres, and um, SQLite. Um, it also is fully localized, so it, it, it takes advantage of all the localization capabilities that are part of Blazor so that the user interface can be localized into different languages. Um, and from the very beginning, the idea behind it is that it should be able to, to leverage all of the different hosting models, which are available as part of Blazor. And so initially, of course, it was designed to run on Blazor server and Blazor WebAssembly, same code base. Um, and then when Blazor Hybrid came around, of course, the idea was that, well, we should allow it to run on Blazor Hybrid as well, um, because then we truly have a cross-platform framework, which is where you can build applications that run anywhere. So. Going down that path, I guess the most important thing that you need to keep in mind when you're building an application um, and you want to target you know, all of these different devices and environments is the architecture is probably the most critical thing. And of course, you've heard that before, but um, in this particular case, the client server architecture in particular is very important. Um, so if you've ever experimented with writing a sample Blazor application, perhaps you chose Blazor Server because it you know, seemed easier to get started with. Um, some of the examples that are provided from, well, actually most of the examples that are provided by Microsoft when it comes to Blazor Server are not client server, right? They basically have Razor components which talk directly to your database through EF Core, all designed to run on the server, which works just fine. However, that's not client server, right? That is a server app. Um, 
And then if you've ever built an application based on Blazor server in that manner, and then decided, oh, I might want to, I might like to try the Blazor WebAssembly hosting model. Well, you can't, right? Unless you rewrite the application because WebAssembly is a true client server architecture, right? Where you have to have a distinct and separate client application that interacts over service calls, right? HTTP client with a backend server. And so if you built your application using the standard template for a Blazor server, you're not going to easily be able to make it run on Blazor WebAssembly. It's going to require a lot of rework. So keep that in mind because when you then want to make the jump to Blazor hybrid, same exact thing, right? It is a true client server model. The idea with um, Blazor hybrid is that the client has to be distinct and separate as it runs on the desktop or it runs on the mobile device and has to communicate back to server endpoints um, that run on the server. And so I guess one thing I guess I was, I was had enough foresight with um, Octane is that from the beginning, it used a client server architecture for both Blazor server and Blazor WebAssembly um, hosting models. Um, and in some ways, it's a little inefficient, right, to use a client server hosting model for Blazor server, because what this means is that it's all running on the server, but it's making HTTP client calls, right, when it's trying to get data from the client to the server, although it's all running on the server anyways, right, so it's looping back to itself. However, it means I have one code base which works on all environments, right, by, by building it in this architecture approach. Um, Octane uses a backend for front-end security architecture. Um, so this middle box here would be the Octane server, which of course is distinct and separate from the client. It handles, of course, authentication, authorization. It has its own set of local APIs for some of that. Um, on the back end, um, from like integrated with the server, you can also integrate identity providers if you so desire using OAuth 2 or OpenID. Um, you can also use you can call remote APIs if you want um, using standard sort of JWT token type of security model. On the front side is where it gets interesting. So we've got an Octane web client, um, and then we have the Octane MAUI client. Both the web client and the MAUI client leverage the same exact Razor components. Um, it's just essentially a different hosting model, right? A different wrapper around them, um, but no code has to be modified. They work equally well in either environment. And so, yeah, we're going to focus a little bit on Maui client here because that's obviously the, the Blazor hybrid approach. Um, Joe and I were talking just before I launched into this presentation about servicing models. And this is a, you know, a, a really important area when it comes to um, client side applications, right? So if any of you have built desktop applications in the past, or I guess even mobile applications, you have a thicker client application, right? Which is installed on the device. And you have to figure out some way of servicing it as you come up with new versions. Um, and to put all of that responsibility onto your IT department is obviously one approach, but it's not a very popular approach uh, because they don't want to have to be dealing with updating all kinds of different um, devices all the time, right? And troubleshooting and, and constantly doing updates. So in the past, if you had built Witten forms or WPF applications, you would often built some mechanism in so that they could service themselves, right? They would call some kind of a server, they would check if there was an application update that was available, they would download the application in the background, and then they would, you know, essentially overwrite the version that was in place, and so you would get the latest version. This problem, of course, never went away. It still exists whenever you have a thick client, and so when it comes to uh, Blazor Hybrid, um, or even Blazor WebAssembly for that matter, because if you understand the way that Blazor WebAssembly works, it essentially downloads your .NET based DLLs, your assemblies to the client browser, and then executes them 
in the client browser using WebAssembly. So even in that model, right, there are bits being transferred from the client or from the server to the client. Um, if you build certain types of like more simple, I guess, applications um, using the, you know, very basic um, Blazor WebAssembly approach, it takes sort of takes care of that for you, the servicing aspects. But as soon as you get into a more elaborate application where you're maybe loading things on demand um, and a more dynamic sort of application, you need to take responsibility for that in your own code. Um, and so, in fact, that's what Octane had to do, right? It had to come up with its own servicing model to deal with these sort of updating of bits problems. And so it, it has exactly sort of the approach that you would take with desktop applications where the client application queries the server to determine um, the list of assemblies that are needed to run your application, then checks to see if those um, assemblies exist on the client already, if they're the right version, if not, it pulls the the, uh, the assemblies to the client automatically and sort of self-services itself. So all you need to do is deploy the latest version of your application to the server, and any clients that are connecting to that server will service themselves. Um, the approach that it takes obviously is slightly different for the two different technologies. So for, for WebAssembly, um, it has more limited capabilities because it runs in the browser sandbox. So it it um, in Octane we leverage the index DB capability, right, to store blobs into obviously that database, which is available in all browsers under HTML5, um, and that's where it's, it stores the assemblies. This also has the added benefit that at startup, right, it doesn't actually have to download all the assemblies every time. If it already has the latest assemblies, right, it doesn't need to download anything, which produces a, a faster startup time. Similarly, on um, Blazor Hybrid, you have a, a thick MAUI client, um, and you have the ability to store files on in a, in, you know, in a specific location, and MAUI provides access to this, this area for you, for your application, right, so you can store data. Um, and so this is where Octane stores um, the assemblies. So the servicing model is kind of built into Octane. Some of the, so so basically, you know, when um, when this new capability came out for Blazor Hybrid, I already mentioned that I wanted to to enhance Octane to allow developers to basically use that capability, and so I started the same place that any developer would start, right? So I created a Blazor hybrid application using the default template that Microsoft provides in Visual Studio, right? So it scaffolded a set of code for me, um, which was a functional application that was runnable, obviously very simple kind of hello world type of application. Um, and then from there, I had to make the adjustments to it so that I could actually integrate it and make it work with the Octane framework. So um, I recognize that there's a main page.xaml that's part of the scaffolded code, and it contains the root component, um, which it's going to launch um, when your application, your MAUI application launches. It also defines a host page, right? And so that's, again, you're the bootstrapped web-based host page, which is part of your MAUI application, which you're going to have to run. Um, and so both of those are, are sort of important entry points to recognize because what I needed to do was launch my main component that was part of Octane. Um, the tricky part was that my main component that's part of Octane isn't part of my MAUI solution. Um, it lives as part of a different assembly that's part of a different solution altogether, right? And it's completely independent. And so what I had to do was I had to find a way to load that application um, and target that component, which was part of that other applications. And luckily, you know, I was able to take advantage of the capabilities of Blazor so that I have a dynamic, I just used the, the, the Blazor dynamic component model. Um, there are a number of different parameters um, that 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 component expected to have passed into it, um, and I could not, um, you know, in the desktop or mobile environment, I don't have those same 
sort of needs as the in a web-based context, right, where I have remote IP address and things like that in a web context. I don't have those in a desktop environment. So, you know, but I still have to pass these parameters into that same component, and I was able to do that. Um, the Blazor hybrid application is bootstrapped by an index.html file. I'll show you that in a moment. Most important part of that, it's actually a very slim um, file. It has very little markup in it all, at all. But the most important thing it has in it is a JavaScript reference to blazor.webview.js. That is, in fact, the bootstrapper right, for Blazor hybrid. Um, so that's the most important thing that has to exist in your Blazor hybrid application. Um, the other thing that you have to keep in mind is that your local static assets need to be packaged with your client application when you deploy it. So your, your Blazor hybrid application will have a WW root folder like it shows here in this diagram um, where you're, you, know, you have CSS files, you have images, and you have JavaScript um, files as well. And so those static apps assets need to be packaged up with your application and deployed as part of your over your MAUI solution. And I'm going to explain a little bit why that's actually a problem in some scenarios. Um, the other thing that most applications need is obviously to deal with data, right? And so, and typically your data is probably not going to reside on the client. Um, it could. Right? You could certainly have like a SQLite database that actually is deployed to the client. That would work just fine. But a lot of applications are going to have a thick client that's going to talk to a server somewhere to retrieve data over service calls. And so your MAUI program has to configure the HTTP client to point somewhere to, you know, to access APIs to, like, with some kind of a base address so that it can get data. Um, and so that's where in the MAUI program is also where you would have to register any API services. So again, your MAUI program uses dependency injection. And so if you have services that you're going to use in your code that are going to be, you know, part of, you know, your constructors, like the standard way that you'd use dependency injection, then you need to register all of those services as part of your MAUI program. Um, also in your MAUI program, so whether, what, the other thing I ran into, which probably most people wouldn't run into, um, is that I needed to actually execute some code at startup. Um, and in my Blazor WebAssembly application, it had support for an asynchronous main startup um, capability. Um, and that would that would be the preference, right? Is to have some a asynchronous way to do background stuff while your application starts up. Unfortunately, um, Blazor Hybrid slash Maui, I guess, didn't have support for an asynchronous main, which is kind of surprising because I think this was a feature that was introduced in like C sharp seven or something, and we're up to like C sharp eleven. But anyway, so this is another thing to keep keep track of is that there's not always parity for certain features across different implementations from Microsoft. So um, I had to do this synchronously because my, my MAUI client application for servicing purposes needs to call a backend server and download assemblies, right? So that it can then load those assemblies into the app domain in the client. Um, and I had to use a synchronous method for that, which works um, fine, but it's not my preferred method of doing this. Um, and so this actually brings up the topic that I, I touched on briefly earlier. And so the topic of static assets. And so really the way that that Blazor Hybrid has been structured, so at the, the bottom box in this diagram is it expects your static assets to be local to the application, meaning they're deployed to the device along with your application. And so when, for example, an image reference, if like because, because so let's take a step back for a minute. So from the left-hand side here, let's say you build a component, right? A Razor component. That Razor component is built in HTML, CSS, all the standard tech that you're used to it's going to have references to static assets. Like here, it's a referencing an image, right? 
using a standard image tag in HTML. If you run this component on Blazor server, it's going to automatically, even though it's it's a relative reference to this, this image, it knows that it's going to have to go to the server in a particular location to find that image. That works great. When you run this application on WebAssembly, same exact thing. That relative reference is going to go to the server and it's going to pull back the image. Works great. Laser hybrid does not work this way. That, that, that reference, that relative reference is going to look locally to the application in a www root folder to look for that image. And if that, you know, if that static asset doesn't exist there, then it's going to have a problem. So this sort of breaks the whole idea that you can have a single code base which works on every hosting model. Um, and unfortunately, the workarounds to this aren't great at the moment um, because Microsoft, I guess, never really thought of this. this there, I've logged a GitHub issue. I've included the issue number here at the bottom. I logged it quite a long time ago. I think it still is being, it's flagged as being, you know, not going to be included in .NET 8. <laughs> um, but to explain like the real problem that happens here. So let's say you have an application um, that's built using Blazor and you want it to target all these different environments. And let's say your application has a file upload capability in it. Right? And that, of course, that file upload is going to upload whatever file that you choose to some backend server, right? It's, it, this is a dynamic capability. So as you're running the application, you choose your local file, you upload it to the server. Of course, that file is not going to exist on the client application, right? You'd have to come up with some way to replicate that file out to all the clients that are running the Blazor hybrid version, which is completely unusable, right? That's not going to work. So I don't know why Microsoft hasn't like recognized that this is like a real problem um, and really breaks the the multi um, multi platform um, capability for Blazor, but Either way, uh, hopefully they'll get this fixed at some point. Um, the workaround that I had to come up with was on my server. What I basically have to do is when I'm serving um, static assets, I have to recognize that the request is being made by a certain user agent. So this is, you know, of course, user agents are not super reliable, but um, my Maui client will send a user agent saying that it's, of course, Blazor hybrid. And when the server recognizes that, it'll be like, oh, I have to include a absolute path, right, to this particular static resource. Because if that static resource is has an absolute path on it, then it will, in fact, go to the server, right? It won't look locally for it. Um, it only tries to... Um, it only tries to resolve relative paths locally. So if it has an absolute path, of course, it's going to go to that specific location. But essentially, like when my Razor components are being rendered in the Maui client, it sort of has to, it has to have this ugly logic, right, to add the absolute path to them or not. Um, I personally don't think this is a great solution. I don't think that this should be a developer concern, right? This kind of stuff shouldn't be in your code. This is a hosting model concern and it should be handled by the platform itself. I believe it probably should be handled in the web view component, right? Which is essentially the hosting environment which your Blazor components are gonna run in. Um, but um, this is the only way to make it work currently. Um, I guess the last thing that I ran into in trying to get Octane to work with Blazor Hybrid was I recognized that in a web context, you sort of have this, for, for authentication, you have this redirect flow, right, where the browser will be redirected to the server to get a cookie, and you'll get redirected back to the browser, and that's, you know, there'll be some transfer of the cookie back and forth. And once you have a cookie in the browser, um, then, of course, you're authenticated and everything will work just fine. Um, however, when you're you know, running in um, a Blazor hybrid environment, you don't you don't have this capability because it's actually you know it's a thick client, 
It's um, running on the device itself through a web view, but you don't have that natural redirect flow um, available to you. And so I um, had to use a different model um, to basically authenticate, but it worked just fine. Um, with the, and with these changes, which actually were not that elaborate, right? Not that, it wasn't that complicated. I was able to actually get Octane running on all devices, right? So I could make it run on Blazor Server, Blazor WebAssembly, and Blazor Hybrid, um, which is pretty cool. Um, and so with that, I think I'll, I'll transfer over now to actually show you some actual code and get out of these slides. Um, for those of you who, um, who aren't familiar with Octane, um, Octane is obviously a module application framework, modeled after, I guess, um, around the capabilities of .NET Nuke, but built from the ground up using Blazor, .NET Core, um, and, and, you know, basically client server architecture, you know, all the modern capabilities. This is the, the website for Octane, um, tells you a little bit about it. This site is actually built on Octane itself. Um, and this is also where I have my um, blog about the various things that are going on with the platform. All of the code, of course, is managed on GitHub. So this um, repo is fairly active. Um, we only recently had a release a couple of days ago. Um, and so over time, we've had like 29 releases of this going way back, of course, to like, the, like I said, like the very early days of Blazor. Um, and so the capabilities keep getting more and more robust. So if I go over to Visual Studio for a moment, I mean, this is the latest dev branch code um, for Octane that I, you know, I pulled from GitHub. Um, it's structured as you would expect a client server application would be structured with a distinct client project, server project, and shared project. Uh, much like you would get if you created a Blazor WebAssembly project from the template that Microsoft provides. Um, if we go into the server project for a moment, obviously there's a lot of, <laughs> a lot of capabilities that are in here. Um, but if we scroll down for a moment to like, so it's got all the various layers you would expect. Uh, if we go down for a moment, we've got an app settings file. Um, by design, the app settings has very few um, settings in it. Um, that was one of the goals is to try and minimize the amount of app settings that this application has. Um, but it needs to obviously have a connection string to connect to a backing database, right? Because there's a lot of services that it provides that have data. Um, that are part of them, that are part of some backend service. So I don't have any connection string defined right now. So if I run this application, it's obviously going to recognize that it's not installed um, and it's going to throw an error. <laughs> Let's try that again. It's kind of weird. I had a weird problem like that earlier today. I don't know why that was happening. Of course, I was making some code changes today, so that might have caused some problems. If this doesn't work, I can still show you something, but I hope that this is going to work. I think I know why this actually happened. So anyways, we'll let the, the full rebuild happen here. And, um, and in a moment, um, I'll be able to, to run this and install it. Um, I had a working installation, but I really wanted to show you from scratch how simple it was to set up. So anyways, like similarly, actually, you would have to go through the steps. So if you pulled down the code from GitHub, um, you would want to build um, the solution, right? So that it would pull all the latest dependencies down for you. Um, and of course, you'd then have a runnable application. And there should not be any errors which happen as part of this rebuild process. And of course, this is going to take longer than I'm hoping because, of course, because I'm doing a demo. All right. Actually, what I might do here is I will maybe close this out for a moment. And close this out. Uh, 
Oh, the machine. There we go. Obviously, it takes a while to build the client app. If anyone has any questions along the way here, please feel free to um, either just vocalize them or put them in the chat. Like I mentioned, this application is not small. Um, and I guess in, in light of like, if you're interested in sort of the anatomy of a very large scale Blazor application, um, this might be interesting to you because um, this, like I said, this is an application that's actually grown quite a lot in functionality and complexity over time. And it has a lot of great examples in it on how to build components that do a lot of different use cases. Um, all right, so we'll run this now, and I'm hoping that it'll work much better this time. There we go. All right, so it's got the latest version here. I'm going to just use uh, local DB, which is essentially SQL Server, right, um, on my local machine as the backing database. Um, by default, I'm going to have to create a, an initial uh, user account. Um, on so that once I log in, or once the application is installed, I got to log in, right, so that I can get access to the more advanced functionality. I'll just put a bogus email address on here. All right, and so just entering, I guess, the simple information, and I say install now. It's going to run all of the migrations because uh, it's using EF Core, um, and it's going to build out my local date local DB database with all of the. Um, entities and objects, right, which are needed to run the application. Um, and so it also has a default template um, with content in it, um, which basically sets up the initial site for you so that you can immediately actually like log into it, which of course I, I use that same account, which I just um, specified as part of the installation process. And when I log into it, um, then I have some more advanced capabilities uh, and some additional pages that are available to me. So you might have noticed when I first showed the application, I had a home page and maybe a my page, I, I think. Um, but once I'm logged in and authenticated, then I have access to a private page because it has a security model around it. Of course, all pages in this in this model are virtual. Um, everything essentially is virtual. Um, there are no physical pages behind it. You build components and then you those components are combined together at runtime to create a composable application. And you've probably heard about composable architecture um, because it's become quite a hot topic again more recently because of you know component-based frameworks, right? Like React, Vue, and of course Blazor. Um, so you can build composable applications, build components, and then reuse them across many different um, renderings of your application. Um, I can go into like an edit mode and it will show me that this page has many different regions that are part of it. And I can in, I can add content to many any of these different regions. Um, it has a pop-up menu to get access to more fun, like more capabilities as well. So every module instance has you know attributes that are part of it has a, a robust permissions model, so you can say which users or roles are allowed to view or edit um, the content that's part of it. This is all kind of built in. This was all functionality that was um, part of .NET Nuke as well. It's just implemented in, of course, a different way here. Um, you got different settings. Um, you can also edit the content itself. So by default, it has a, um, a rich text editor for this particular type of module, although you can build any type of module, which is essentially an application that you want. And in fact, Octane itself uses this capability. Everything in Octane is essentially a, a Razor component. So if I go into the control panel, I've got a lot of different capabilities that are part of this admin dashboard. Everything that's displayed here is essentially a Razor component that lives in that open source project, which you can basically see the functionality of if you look on GitHub. Um, so like if I want to see all the metadata related to this site, I can do that. Um, it's important to note that Octane is multi-tenant. 
So you can actually host multiple sites from the same installation. Um, and even beyond that, if every if you want every site to have its own distinct database, um, but a shared runtime, you can do that as well. So it's got a more advanced multi-tenant capability than what was available in .NET Nuke in the past. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of functionality that's available um, in the site. But I mean, I want to talk about Blazor Hybrid. So I have the application up and running. Um, and I'm going to leave it up and running. And now I'm going to go into Visual Studio and I'm going to load the Octane.Maui um, solution, um, which is part of, like, it's in the repository. It's just a separate solution that's in the root folder um, that's, uh, that's in the Octane repo. So I'm going to open this up. I've got it compiled already. We're going to look here and we're going to see Maui program. And I have a hard coded URL that's defined here, localhost 44357. That is the same address as my web instance, which is running, right? So, and that's important, right? Because what I'm going to do is I'm going to run this Maui client application uh, as a desktop. And we, we can see that if I load, if I, um, how come the emulators aren't displayed? It should be displayed. Anyways, if I click start, let's see if this is going to work. It should run using the Windows emulator. Yeah, so it's going to use, you know, um, the Windows emulator, which is part of the Maui tool set to run a Windows client application. It's going to basically, it, it, it downloaded the Octane client application, which includes all of the Razor components, and it rendered all of those Razor components within this, you know, thick Maui client. Um, so this would be like a desktop rendering of that same, so no changes to the code base, right? It just, it runs in the Maui client um, as a thick desktop client. I can log into this as well using the same exact credentials that I provided previously. And it functions in exactly the same way. Of course, like a Razor component is HTML, CSS, JavaScript, right? Standard stuff. But of course, it's running within the web view, within the Maui client. In this example, and over here in my browser, it's running as, as a, actually a Blazor server application currently. So this is like, I guess demonstrating the capability that you can have a um, single code base that runs both in web as well as on desktop as well as on mobile. I don't have the um, Android emulator set up at the moment or iOS, iOS em emulator set up at the moment on this desktop machine, so I can't show you that. But I mean, to run those is as simple as like using the Visual Studio tooling and in the start menu, you'd have the different um, options available to you to choose the different devices you or the different emulators you want to run under. I had some difficulty running locally with Android just because it has different sort of elements to its security sandbox, um, but um, it still works just fine. So with that, I'm going to actually stop running um, the, the Octane web client, and I'm going to also stop running the Maui client, and I'm going to show you another, I guess, example. So I'm going to not run locally this time, but I'm going to run against a remote server, right? So this, this site here, um, DNF projects, and I'll just do a quick build build the project but if we if i open a, a browser here and i go to dnfprojects.com this is a website that's running on azure it's running octane um, and it's a website actually where we keep track of the dotnet foundation projects uh, in terms of which ones are the most active and so i guess by default it's looking at the last month's activity um, and i actually usually i i 
tweet every month about which projects are the most active. And so we can see that Avalonia, you know, was had the most pull requests um, out of all the projects that are members of the .NET Foundation uh, in the last month. And so uh, actually Octane's on here as well. Um, and it has different categories. So every day it goes out to GitHub and it harvests data uh, related to these different categories um, for all for the different projects, right? Um, Octane has a built-in capability um, using iHosted service um, to run scheduled jobs in the background. So that's all part of the Octane framework as well. So that's what it's using to, to go out and, and get data. Um, I've got different categories here as well. So these were just the community projects. Um, we also keep track of the Microsoft projects as well. Um, and obviously like this user interface is, is built using Blazor, right? Using Razor components. Um, it's using chart.js as its JavaScript library for rendering the visualization um, using Blazor Interop. But I mean, this is essentially a Razor component. Um, so these are all the top um, Microsoft open source projects that are part of the foundation. Obviously, Maui's on the list. Um, and then, of course, we have a seed category as well for projects that are not quite at hopefully, you know, the level of size or maturity yet to become member project, but we to track the activity around them as well. But um, so this this obviously is running remotely on a server, like I said, in Azure. Um, but if I go back to my Maui project, and I'm going to say that I'm going to run my local Maui project, but I'm going to actually reference this URL for the data that's going to be, you know, displayed in my in my desktop application that's running locally. Um, so if I run this, um, again, it's going to run Octane locally in my desktop, but it's going to make service calls to that website to get the data. <laughs> Okay, then we've got a problem there. That's interesting. This was all right. So that interesting. Let me try one more thing. So I have another site <laughs> that I want to try as well. So this is another site that does visualizations. So I'm a I'm a ho NHL hockey fan. I, I still actually play ice hockey myself. Um, and there's a site called hockeystats.com that I have had for a very long time. Um, and it basically harvests um, data every day um, related to the various games that happen in the NHL. Um, and it keeps track of all the statistics, right? It, so it's a trend analysis by game for all of the different teams and players that are part of the NHL. Um, and so this was this is completely built in Blazor as well. Um, and this is running um, in Azure, running on Blazor server. Um, and so again, if I run my Maui application and target it for data, um, <laughs> hopefully this will work. It was working yesterday and I must have changed something that caused uh, some difficulty. And that's what I get for not retesting my demo before, <laughs> before doing it today. All right, so this one's gonna work. All right, so again, so in this case, I had my de desktop application. Um, it retrieved my client, the client aspects of my application um, from the server. It loaded it into the desktop uh, into the app domain, and it's basically executing those Razor components locally on my desktop, and it's also going out to that website to get the data um, using H2B client service calls, right? Um, and rendering like a jet, like I said, this is still chart.js, right? This is still a JavaScript library for rendering this particular visualization. Um, and so again, using the same exact code base and i can actually show you the code base um so we'll, we'll as an example i was going to show you this dnf projects actual project it's one of the sample projects which is in the octane repo so if you if you go to the octane organization um, there's a few sample projects this is one of them and you can see it's built as a completely separate solution 
dnf.projects, completely separate from Octane. It has references to Octane packages, of course, um, but it has its own distinct client application, its own distinct server, so because it has its own distinct services, um, it has its own scheduled jobs, um, where it gets data from GitHub. So this is a standalone solution because the idea here is that Octane is a framework and you shouldn't modify the code that's in the framework itself. If you want to extend the framework, you take advantage of the extensibility points and you build applications separate, right? Just like you would if you're building an application that targets Blazor or .NET Core, right? You don't, you don't tightly couple it or integrate it with those frameworks, right? You build them separately and they take advantage of the capabilities of those frameworks. And that's the same way that Octane works. So it provides a lot of capabilities that are not natively available in Blazor and probably will never be available as part of Blazor, such as multi-tenancy and other things. And so I guess that, um, that kind of concludes what I was hoping to show you. Um, there's obviously a lot more functionality here behind the scenes, but um, I hope the main thing that I was able to communicate is that this idea that you can build an application that is one code base that works in all platforms and devices is possible using Blazor Hybrid. Does anyone have any questions? I know as a speaker, I hate silence immediately after I finish. Um, <laughs> that was a very good presentation, very interesting. Uh, it's a great take on my questions that I asked before we started, and I appreciate you very much showing that. Uh, I, I definitely, I mean, maybe uh, Octane is a great way for us to build the application I was talking about because it gives all the capabilities that I, I mentioned that I need, and there's an awful lot of code that I don't have to write if I do that. <laughs> Yep, that is the idea, right? There's an awful lot of sort of plumbing stuff that you shouldn't have to rewrite over and over again. That was the original premise of .NET Nuke, and it is the, it's the premise of Octane as well. Um, and in fact, where you said that, like you made a comment at the beginning that the client ne doesn't necessarily want to build an entire web application, right, to service mm -hmm. their needs, because that would be a lot of work. Maybe mm -hmm. Octane provides a lot of what you need already, right? And then you right. you have a web application already, and you would be able to build a few specialized modules to integrate with it, um, which is a lot less work than building an entire web application. Right, and it also services the need, that the request that they had, that they don't have to start over again from scratch for the next app. They can leverage what they've already done. Right, yeah. Sorry, I got to... So there's some, is there some questions here? Oh, Dunning-Kruger effect. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, well, I guess I, that means I did my job, but um, yeah. Obviously like, so I, and I will say this, right? Just like any framework, it, it, Octane has its nuances, um, similar to, you know, if you got into React, you have to learn the nuances of React or Angular, right? They all have their nuances. And by using a framework, you do take certain dependencies on those frameworks, um, which means that you may run into scenarios where you may not have as much control as you wish you had. Um, but on the, the trade-off there is you get a lot of functionality out of the box. And if you are able to leverage all that functionality, you are much further ahead. Right? And so that's that's sort of the, the double-edged sword, I guess I would say, with any framework, right? They're accelerators to a point, but if you sort of come up with use cases which are outside of the things that they provide you, sometimes it can be a little bit more difficult, right, to, to implement those things than it would have been if you had, like, bit-level control. Um, of course, if you want to have bit-level control, that's a lot of heavy lifting. So... You know, those are the trade-offs. Do you have any indication of how many people are using Octane? I know, would pull requests be, or not pull requests, but uh, downloads be the best indicator? Um, so you could look at downloads. Um, so, <laughs> and because Octane is not packaged 
like a normal <laughs> web application. Like as of as of today, there is no file new project story in Visual Studio for Octane, right? Which is what most developers are used to. There probably should be, <laughs> but there's not. Um, the, the I, I would say because of that, well, for I guess on one side I would say the download counts on NuGet um, are heavily skewed by bots and and many things, but they still give you maybe a relative measure of how much a project is is actually. I don't even know if it's a good measure of how it's, much it's used, right? It's pretty easy to do file new project, spin up a project and never use it, right? So that's right. not a good indicator of usage. Um, and I think that's some of the problem with the vanity metrics that we have today in the .NET space is like, what truly are people using? <laughs> um, but I guess to, to better answer your question, we do have some usage metrics um, around Octane. There are about 50 to 100 um, installations, at least, that are happening um, on a weekly basis. So there, there is quite, a, but that, that does, again, doesn't necessarily mean those are all being converted into real applications, right? So there's a lot of people kicking the tires. Um, there definitely are a number of sites using Octane to build both internal and external facing applications. Um, okay. What what kind of telemetry do you have? Uh, if if I were to go ahead and set this up as a, a website that I was going to use in my application, uh, say internally, uh, what kind of yeah. telemetry do I have for usage and performance and things like that? So it doesn't have any like Azure telemetry built into it um, at this point. Um, it has obviously like a you know a logging layer where everything that's happening within the framework is, is being logged, of course, using like a serial log type of approach. Mm. Um, all of that actual information is actually being logged to a database and it has a user interface over the top of it. So you can actually access it just by logging in and you don't have to actually get access to the server, right? You can, mm. you can actually slice and dice the log through the user interface itself if you are a, an administrator user of the application. Um, as far as performance counters, um, it, it, yeah, it, it doesn't have tight integration with like App Insights or anything like that at this point. Okay. Um, you, you could enable those things, I guess, within your Azure environment, right, to get more insights into what's going on with the application. All right, any other questions for Sean? All right, doesn't sound like it. Uh, so there, I dropped the link to the feedback survey into the chat. I will also send that out via email as well in case you happen to miss that link. Uh, so um, your honest feedback is very much appreciated. All Responses are anonymous, so just let us know how we did. And Sean, I will get that to you as soon as the survey closes. I typically leave that open about 24 hours for responses. Okay, cool. All right, thanks for the opportunity of presenting. Yeah, uh, I hope it was thank you. Useful. Yeah, thank, thank you, Sean. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you very much. All right, thanks everyone. Have a good night. Uh, yep, yeah, you too. Bye.